glad you could come back this week. Have you heard that commercial? Of course you have, because we all have. There's a guy that stands up there, his picture's up behind me on the wall, and he's talking about Capital One, and he ends with, hey, what's in your wallet? Well, the lesson this week is a similar question. It is what's in your closet? What's in your closet? Um, his ad prompted me to ask that question of myself. What's in my closet? And consequently, for us to benefit from that, we have to ask ourselves what's in our closet. Um, hopefully, every time you see the Capital One ad, you'll remember this lesson. What's in your closet? Uh, Webster's Online Dictionary defines closet as this, an unusually small room, like that closet, that is used for storing things, like clothing, boxes, junk, paperwork, whatever. So it's either a small storage room uh, used to store things, but always small, or the second um, illustration that they use for the word closet is this, a state in which someone will not talk about something or admit something. He's in the closet. You know, before uh, the last couple of years, if somebody was gay like Congressman Bonnie Frank or whatever, they were in the closet. Now they're all out of the closet and they wear the badge called gay on their clothing um, to say we've accomplished something. We've changed the laws so that the act of homosexuality and lesbianism, lesbianism is no longer a sin. Well, that's where they are. That's not necessarily where the good Lord is because he talks against that. But I'm not here to talk about that subject today. But I had to ask myself, well, what's in my closet? You know, am I, uh, do I have a clean closet? Do I have things that I'm proud of, that I'm hiding in there? Or do I have things that I don't want you to know about, that I'm hiding in my closet? Do you have things you're hiding in your closet that you don't want people to know about? Well, um, I had to ask myself, do I dare share? stuff that's in my closet with others? And the answer is yes. I've written seven books so far. Well, the seventh one I finished, but I'm missing one ingredient to get that released. And as soon as that happens, you'll know about it because I'll be right back here telling you about it. But nonetheless, most of my books tell people what's in my closet, what's been in my closet, what's still in my closet, and, you know, should these things stay in my closet? The answer to that is no. So how do we get them out of our closet? How do we let other people know what's in your closet? And should we even let them uh, know what's in our closet? Well, most of you who do know me personally know that I'm kind of an open book. The uh, old saying, he wears his heart on his sleeve, is probably true. Uh, the reason is that I never, as you know, I've said it a million times, I never let other people ride my emotional Ferris wheel to the top or to the bottom based on what they think of me. I just don't do it. Um, I can bluntly say I really don't care what they think, and that's really true because sometimes, no matter what you say or you do, or what I say or I do, anybody within um, earshot of what we say or I shot if you will, of what we do, they're going to make a uh, determination in their brain based on what they think that you just said or did, right? So why would you let them ride your emotional Ferris wheel to the top? Well, I don't like what he said because they interpreted what you said is this when what you really said was this. I, I've had it happen so many times in my life. So. Many years ago, I adopted the philosophy that I just don't care because whatever they say or do should not influence my life. I'm the one that has to stand alone by myself in front of God and explain this, that, or the other thing when asked. I only have to give an account for me. I don't have to give an account for somebody else. So they should, and they only have to give, or you have to give an account for yourself, what you say 
or what you do. It's your business. Okay, let me move on. Um, biblically, biblically speaking, God tells us when we pray, He says, go into your closet, go into your secret place, and when you pray to me in secret, I will reward you openly. Let me tell you what He means by that. When you go into your closet, and he's not talking about a literal closet, I happen to use my office at home, but I'll go in there, that's my little private place where I can talk to God, and I talk to God not out loud. I've learned before, when I speak out loud, um, the old devil can hear that, and he makes things happen, and then... Uh, he tries to say, well, see, that happened just like you prayed, but it didn't happen like you wanted it to, so therefore God didn't honor what you prayed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I could tell you story after story of that, and I have in the past, um, how I would pray for certain things out loud, and then my phone would ring, and all of a sudden it was like, wow, that's a quick answer to prayer. No, it wasn't. It was just there to aggravate me and then prove, well, see, God let you down again. So I've learned, never pray out loud, pray in secret, uh, in my closet, if you will, or in my office. The reason that Bible verse came about, by the way, was Jesus made a notation in the Bible um, where Pharisees, those are the Jewish lawyers, the leaders of the Jewish temple, but they would always wear certain, you know, hierarchy clothing, so you knew the guy was a Pharisee. You know, he was a mucky muck in the temple, if you will. But what they used to do is they would go out in front of the temple or in the streets, the busy streets of Jerusalem, for example, and they would grab a hold of the uh, lapels or whatever on their Jewish attire that said, I'm a, a Pharisee, and they would stand there and thump on their chest and pray out loud to God so that everyone who heard them or saw them praying out loud and they'd pray real loud so that half a dozen people up and down the street would know oh he must be really top notch up, right up there with God well Jesus didn't like that at all he said to the Pharisees he said you know what when you're out here praying out loud so that everybody can hear you you already have your reward you have your reward, and your reward is just what you're seeking. Admiration, respect from the people around you. That's why you pray like you do out loud and all braggadocious-like. Whereas, that's why Jesus says, when you pray, go into your closet in secret and pray to me in secret. To me, that means just in my mind, I'm praying to the Lord. And he says, I will reward you openly, meaning... People will see that you have just been rewarded. You will get the answer to your prayer, and you will be rewarded, and I will bless you, and people will see how I'm blessing you, and they'll wonder, what is it that you have? How come you are blessed? Gloria. So that's why that came about, and that's why I'm speaking to you about closets, things we hide in our closet, the little secret things in our life, and then things that God says, when you go into your private secret closet, pray to me secretly and I will reward you openly. Now, in Luke chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, it says that this. It's kind of, it has to do with everything about that closet of secrecy that we hide things in. <clears throat> but Jesus says, there is nothing that you can hide or conceal that will not be made known. Think about that. There's nothing you think you're hiding, like, oh, those people don't know it, God knows it, and he's telling us right here. There's nothing you can seal or nothing you can uh, hide that will not be made known. It will come to light because God causes it to come to light. Um, what you have said, the Bible verse says, what you have said or done in the dark, meaning in secret, will be brought to light. And whatever you have whispered in the ears of others in secret, like gossiping, hey, you know, John Tyler, blah, 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 the Bible says it will be proclaimed from the rooftops. So he doesn't want you to be whispering in secret 
in the ear of people about other people that you know called gossip because when you do that that becomes a loudly shouted fact to everyone who hears it because you just told somebody in secret hey do you hear about John Tyler blah 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 then they, then they take that gossip and they tell two people and they tell two people and before you know it the whole town Here's about what you did or didn't do based on the first one that gossiped. That's why he says, well, try to, don't let people ride your emotional Ferris wheel to the top or bottom because it doesn't really matter what people think, say, or do about everything that you say or do. And some people, they're just plain busybodies. They have nothing better to do than uh, go and talk about you. You know it, I know it. I've had things come back to me that I started rumors. I, I know who to tell stuff to. And I was just testing this one time. So I told this one person who I know is a gossiper. And sure enough, she went out and blabbed it. And it went all around Robin Hood's barn and came back to me through my sister. Who said, John, I heard that and she would blast it out. It was totally different from what I started with this rumor. It, totally different. It wasn't like, who? What is that? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't even, it didn't remotely resemble what I told the first person, but it proved out this verse. It's absolutely true. So, in better words found over in Numbers, the Old Testament, chapter 32, Verse 33, he says this, Be very certain that your sins will find you out. We've heard that before, probably even in churches. Be sure your sins will find you out. They will become made known. God makes them known. When Jim Baker, the evangelist, was messing around with his secretary, I'm sure that he thought, well, nobody's going to know. But like the earlier verse said, God knows. And God exposed it through the secretary saying, hey, I'm going to turn you in, Jimbo. And Jim, and then other things were uncovered about the ministry, unfortunately, or fortunately, because God exposed them to the light. And uh, it, it just so happened that he was uh, doing things wrong and illegally. He ended up in jail for I don't know how many years. Uh, Bill Clinton is another perfect example. I'm sure that he figured he'd never be um, exposed to the media the way he was, but he was totally humiliated based on what he did in secret. God knew he was doing it, and therefore it just came out in the open, came out in the press, and be sure your sins will find you out. So sometimes it's better to empty that closet in the first place. So, what's in your closet? Uh, a great list of my own sins uh, that were in my closet Prior to 2007, now most of you know, that in 2007, December, I asked the good Lord, show me your plan and your purpose in my life. And when he did that, he said, all right, I'll show you my plan and purpose, but you're going into boot camp for a while, God's boot camp. And that was a rough 16 months, but he exposed everything, get rid of my pride, get rid of all kinds of stuff that I needed to shed so that he could mold me and make me and shape me into what... He wanted me to do to accomplish his plan and purpose, including getting on YouTube, including doing these messages. So some of the things that were in my closet, and some of the things are still there, and I'll point them out because, again, I'm an open book, is uh, that I didn't trust God like I should. Believe me, I'd say, ah, I trust you, but it was like 50%. Now I trust God 100% because he's proven to be uh, trustworthy, if you will. Everything he said in this Bible and promised to do, he's done so far in my life. I could go on chapter and verse uh, of all the things he's done, uh, but I don't have the time to do it. So that was one of the things. I didn't trust God like I should. So that's out of my closet. Uh, I do, did things on my own instead of letting God lead, and then I follow, like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells me to do. So I had to learn that lesson. I learned it the hard way in God's hard way. See, I'm a Yankee. 
in God's boot camp. I learned it, but I, it's out of the closet now. So that's out on the table. You know it, and I know it. Um, when I was, uh, I walked away from God for about 12 years. I was mad at him because he gave me a ton of money, a million eight one time. And then it seemed like he took it all away to pay for this, that, and the other thing. Um, long story so, I'll just shorten it. But he took all the money away except for about $2,000 of it. A million eight hundred thousand. But it taught me a lesson. One is that he gave me the money to be used for the purposes uh, which he used it for because he knew years before I, when I would need the money in the year, uh, I think it was 2004, I'd need all of the money. And, and uh, even before that, he used a, uh, a few, a bunch of the money, maybe uh, 358000 to be exact, to donate to the church because they needed to buy land for their Christian school. Okay, so he knew, in other words, what I needed. But I looked at it like, you took all my money away. It wasn't my money, nonetheless. So I got mad at God. I walked away from him for 12 years. Well, another thing in my closet was that while I was away from God, I hung around with people that weren't Christians. I hung around with people that swore, so I swore. I hung around people who drank beer, wine, whatever. So I drank beer and wine. Now remember, I was saved at age 11. I was a deacon in my church for years. I was a Sunday school teacher teaching uh, sixth graders. They were like 12-year-old girls and boys and also adults. So I was all that. And then here I am, years later, walking away from God, doing all kinds of stuff that I shouldn't be doing. And so... That's out of the closet now. That's exposed. And I've dealt with that, believe me. Uh, hating people was another thing that was in my closet. I didn't put up with a lot of stuff from people. Uh, I really didn't. I just didn't have any use whatsoever for people. If it wasn't about me, I didn't care. So some people would still think that I'm that way because I'm really direct like I am being now and here. Uh, being very unkind towards others. Uh, I pointed out before in another message, if some kid was walking toward me and he had his hat on backwards, I just got an attitude all of a sudden. Punk. Maybe he was the nicest kid on the planet, but I judged him to be a punk. That's what I'm talking about here. That's out of the closet because I treat people the way the Lord would want me to treat them is everybody has, uh, everybody has a soul Everybody, he wants every one of them to go to heaven. Sometimes people are down and out and they need a little hand. I'm reminded even of this week, somebody didn't even have gas money. So I went down on my bank, I took a hundred bucks out because if they didn't have gas, they didn't have food either. And I gave them the money and I said, here, it's not a loan, I don't want it back. God gives to me what I give to you, so don't worry about it. So that took care of the need. That's the kind of attitude that I had to learn. So that part is out of my closet. And then, uh, failure to pray at all during those 12 years I was away. I could care less about God or anything about Him. I didn't go to church. I could care less. Uh, that attitude of mine is certainly gone and out of the closet. And then, I had a lot of money and things and houses and cars and everything. So I was like the Pharisees. Hey! And everybody knew I had a ton of money. So I was letting my wealth go to my head, and I had all kinds of pride about it. Hey, I earned it. Hey. I didn't earn it. I learned since then that it is God who gives the power to get wealth, Deuteronomy 8.18. It is God who says in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 8, the silver and the gold, it is mine. And because it's mine, I give you, 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 the power to get wealth. I give it or I don't give it. I give you your next breath or I don't. I give you, and this was a tough lesson I had to learn during boot camp, I give you food on your table or I don't. So I learned everything that I get is given to me or really loaned to me by God because I'm not taking anything with me when I go, I can tell you that. So I can go on and on with what's in my closet or certainly what was in my closet, and now what's out of my closet, 
I uh, did a little spring cleaning there. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. It says this, uh, Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the church of Corinth. He says, Renounce those things that are secret and shameful, like I'm doing now. Renounce them. Say, I'm not doing those anymore. Clean out the closet is what he's telling us. And he says, on the contrary, set the, forth the truth uh, before man and before God. He goes on to say, well, God goes on to say that we should empty, <coughs> see, too much dust. Empty the closets of all those hidden secrets. Get rid of deception. Get rid of lying. Get rid of backbiting. Get rid of gossip. Don't distort God's word. Instead, we should be telling the truth and being real and honest in our life. And he also says that everybody, when you're real and honest about your own life, um, then everybody around you will be blessed as a result of it. And so will God be blessed because you've cleaned out your, your closet of shame uh, and those things that you do in secret. Well, how do you clean that closet out? How do you... How do you renounce, if you will, these secret and shameful ways that we've hidden in our closet? Well, James, the half-brother of Jesus, tells us in James 5.16, he says this, Confess your faults, confess your sins one to another. And he's talking about uh, talking to people of like faith, if you will, your friends at church or people that you really trust. Um, Get rid of the deception, talk about it, confess your, your sins one to another uh, so that we might be healed of those sins. So by talking and confessing our sins one to another, we become healed of those sins. In other words, we can bring them forth first to God to ask Him for forgiveness and then talk about it to your friends, the ones you can trust. Otherwise, if you've got somebody going to be gossiping, I wouldn't tell them certain things, that's for sure. Um, here, Jesus is teaching us that we should have certain Christian friends with whom we can confide. Now, when you're confessing your sins one to another, uh, I recommend that you confess them female to female, not female to male, or vice versa. I can tell you from experience, when you get real close like that to somebody of the opposite sex, I've had it happen s several times, uh, all of a sudden, the woman that you're talking to and she's confessing her faults, you're confessing your faults, sometimes they sense that you are listening to them, which you are, but their husband at home has not been listening to them. So they trip over a magic line and they begin to attach themselves to you. So then you have to kind of back off and then they uh, take that like, you know, what did I do wrong? So, I'm just telling you from experience, if you're a woman, share and confess those faults to another woman, uh, and vice versa. Um, let's say, uh, here's some words from, uh, and why, by the way, you should confess your faults one to another, so that you can pray for one for another, is this. It says in Matthew 18, 20, where two or more, it actually says where two or three, but I'll say wherever two or more, are gathered together in my name, meaning you're praying, like even at church. You could have 15 or 20 people in church doing a little prayer thing, and you say, look, I need prayer in this area of my life. Where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I will be in their midst. That's why, to me, when he says, if you're all, all alone and by yourself, go in your closet, pray in secret, and then I will reward you. I will answer that openly so that people will really know that I've answered your prayer. And that's why I don't speak out loud. Because where one is gathered together, me, and I open my mouth loud, he hears me, like I've said earlier in this message, and then things happen where he can twist it around and say, see, you thought it was an answer from God. He doesn't answer your prayers. Give it up. Forget it. So I understand that.
pray in your closet in secret, or if two or more are gathered together, there I will be, Jesus says, in your midst. And when he's in your midst, trust me, the devil is not there in your midst. Now, maybe spring cleaning is due, right? We all like to do spring cleaning, even me, and I'm a guy. Uh, the benefits of spring cleaning, cleaning out the closets, is that when you have a clear, clean closet, you also have a clear, clean conscience. When you have gotten rid of the guilt and the shame, if you will, of what you have hidden in your closet, you're going to feel much better about you, and most of your stress will be uh, gone, really. It just goes away. I can say that from experience. When you clean out your closet, your conscience is just as clean as that closet, and you can function in life without being in a crowd and saying, oh, if they only knew how bad I was, oh, if they only knew I was doing this, that, and the other thing. God knows, and be sure your sins will find you out. Uh, we can clean that, we can clean our closet out easily. First, confess it to the Lord. That's what we're instructed to do. Next, as I say, talk about it to your Christian friends, male to male, female to female. Um, once it's prayed over and your sin in your closet you're trying to clean out is out before others and they're praying for and with you, uh, and you bring it to the Lord, and in 1 John 1, 9, he says, for everybody who comes to me and they confess their sins, I will... I'll be faithful and just to forgive those sins, and I will cleanse you from all your unrighteousness, all your sins. That's why I almost have to come before the Lord every morning I start my day out that way. Go before the Lord, confess my sins, ask Him to lead me, guide me, direct me, ask Him to forgive me of my sins, and so that I can start the day out right with a clean closet and a fairly clean conscience. I would recommend that you could start cleaning your closet out today as I finish this. Um, again, I did it in 2007, um, so I have to tell you that a clean closet is a great place to start, and God can use an empty vessel. Let me show you what I mean by that. In the book of Romans, chapter 9, 21, as I finish this, it says this, a potter, you know, like working with clay, a potter has the right to do what he wants to with the clay. It's his clay. And it says he can make something for a special occasion or something for ordinary use from the same lump of clay. What he's saying here is God is the potter. We're the vessel. We're the clay. Once you clean your closet out, it's like a fresh lump of clay ready for God to use and mold and shape into what he wants you to become. It's a great way to, to operate in life. Clean closet, clean conscience, God can now mold you, shape you, and make you into what He wants you to be. I call that seeking God out and discovering what His plan and purpose is for your life. So why not let God mold you, make you, and shape you today? Now I have a link here on YouTube in case you don't know the Lord is your Savior, and that will show you, it's a salvation link it says, but that will show you why you need a Savior, uh, what that's all about, there's some Bible verses in there, and a prayer so that if you say something along the lines of that prayer, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved from the lake of fire into a place called heaven for eternity. But the best place to start tomorrow is with the clean closet. So when somebody asks you now what's in your wallet, if you see that ad, remember, what's in my closet? And try to remember this message if you can and work on it so that you can get the stuff out of that closet. It's going to take a whole lot of stress off your life as it has mine. With that, I'll see you guys next week. I appreciate you coming by. I did say to the Lord years ago that every week, to the best of my ability, I'm going to try to bring a message, whether four people come and listen to it or whether 300 or 1,000. So here I am being faithful, learning to trust the Lord and going uh, about His business on a day-to-day -day basis with as clean a closet as I can get. 
I'll see you guys next week.